And the issue of the day, and boy, are the uh, right-wingers just totally bat guano crazy about it, is Iran. Uh, Jacob, if you could cue up uh, clip number 12 here. Uh, this, this is a compilation of just a few recent press reports. Iran's threat to the United States in the United States. Tonight, defying the world. The Iranians claim a major advance in their nuclear program. Iran is changing its game plan. Further proof that Iran wants to join the club of nuclear nations. All right, showdown with Iran. Iran is warning that it may take preemptive action. The evidence of a kind of shadow war now being waged by Iran around the world. All of that uh, from CommonDreams.org, and, and tip of the hat to the fine folks there who put it together. Uh, Paul Pillar is with us. He is the visiting professor and director of studies uh, in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University, uh, WashingtonMonthly.com, where you can find his writings. Paul, welcome to, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks. Nice to be with you. Uh, very, very happy to he- have you with us, Dr. Pillar. Uh, can we live with a nuclear Iran? Uh, Yes, we can. Uh, We've lived with uh, nuclear weapons in the hands of more fearsome, even more nefarious regimes in the past. I mean, you know, the first one we dealt with was uh, no less than Stalin's Soviet Union. And then we had Mao's China. And this is before the memory of of most of your listeners, but uh, China tested its first nuclear weapon back in 1964. This was during the Johnson administration. And there was so much concern back then that the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, uh, tried to use some kind of domestic public diplomacy by reassuring people, don't, don't get too scared about this, even though that Chinese regime is so awful. And we should recall that at the time, you know, Mao Zedong was saying things like, well, a nuclear war you know, wouldn't be too bad. Uh, China would probably lose about a third of its population, could lose even half of its population, but we'd still come out ahead of uh, capitalism. Well, that was right around the time that China had a massive famine, wasn't it, and, and tens of millions of people died? Well, this was uh, toward the end of the Great Leap Forward, in which tens of millions of people died. And then in the subsequent several years, the first few years after uh, the, uh, the acquisition of the nuclear weapon, we had Mao's Cultural Revolution, which was one of the most chaotic and fanatical periods in Chinese history. Mm. And despite all that, uh, deterrence was maintained. And indeed, a few years after that, uh, Richard Nixon made rapprochement with Beijing the centerpiece of his global strategy. So we've been all through this sort of thing before. And there, were, there was, of course, the first Islamic bomb, as it was then called, when Pakistan got it. Yep. Now, now, none of these things are, are good as far as nuclear proliferation is concerned. It's always a blow to the non-proliferation uh, order to have another uh, regime get a nuclear weapon, but it is not anything like the uh, cataclysm that it's been made out to be. Yeah, and and uh, if, if as, and in fact, my recollection of, of back in the '60s was there was concern that you know if the Chinese are willing to to go through a situation where many millions of their people starve, then then they may be willing to bomb us to get food. I mean, they, there was you know all this hype around that. Um, uh, as I vaguely recall, I was 13 in 1964. But the, the question, I mean, the, this, we've had two, well, the former head of Mossad and the former head of Israeli intelligence, which is some apparently separate from Mossad, I have both come on the last week and said that a nuclear Iran does not represent an existential threat to uh, Israel. You're saying it doesn't represent a threat to the United States. Uh, well, is, are those, both, both of those statements accurate? Yes, yes, they are. In fact, we, we've had several... Uh, we've had a couple of different uh, previous uh, heads of Mossad, and that is the Civilian Intelligence Service, uh, Israel's counterpart to the CIA, as well as, according to one report, the current head of the service, all explicitly denying uh, that uh, this would be, an Iranian nuke would be a, an existential threat to Israel. And it's easy to see why they would deny it, since even if Iran got the bomb, Israel would retain overwhelming military superiority at the nuclear level, where by most accounts Israel has at least 100, possibly 200, or even 300 you know, nuclear w- weapons, right. as well as conventional systems and uh, delivery systems that are far beyond anything Iran would have. Right, and we have over 10,000, and we've got 40, uh, if my recollection is correct, more than 40 military bases within 100 miles of the border of Iran. Well, that, that's right. And 
to the extent that Iran is interested in acquiring a nuclear weapon, and I have no reason to disbelieve the judgments of our senior intelligence officials, that they have not yet made such a decision, but are only keeping their options open. But if they do decide to do that, uh, their overwhelming uh, motivation for doing it would be deterrence. Uh, you know, they all they have to do is listen to the uh, well. They could listen to that uh, compendium of uh, uh, news clips that you just played a moment ago, and all the accompanying rhetoric about uh, should we bomb them now or versus bomb them later. And you can understand the authorities in Tehran have plenty of reason to want to have a deterrent, but so far they don't seem to have made that. Which, which raises the question, if, if common sense, if diplomats, if the President of the United States, who said, you know, this rhetoric isn't helping, when Mitt Romney wrote his op-ed in the Washington Post last week saying uh, that Iran was working on a bomb and was hustling as fast as they could, um, not his exact words, but words to that effect, uh, which is what prompted the two uh, Israeli intelligence officials to come out and say, oh, whoa, wait a minute. If all that is true, why is it that there is this steady drumbeat for war? This is a country with 73 million human beings in it. I mean, 73 million people. That's, that's, it, it, it's a fairly modern country. It's, it, this is, I, I don't get it. I, I don't, and, and the phrase existential threat to the existence of Israel, I have heard, you know, I heard at least twice on the Sunday talk shows this weekend, this last weekend, and you can hear virtually every day, sometimes every hour on Fox News, where's this coming from? Well, most of it is coming from Israel, and it's perhaps hard for those of us uh, who have grown up in other circumstances to totally duplicate the, the emotions and the mindset of people in Israel, and this does go beyond just the Netanyahu government, although that government is the one who's been exploiting the issue, of fear of emotion, uh, given history, given, of course, the outrageous anti-Israel rhetoric we hear from Ahmadinejad in Tehran. But all of that is very different from the question of what actually would be in Israel's interest, and it's far, far different from what would be in U.S. interests. When, when someone like Meyer Dagan, the, the, the former head of Mossad, who said an is, Israeli military attack on Iran is the stupidest idea I've ever heard, says something like that. What he has in mind, I think quite accurately, is the concept that if Israel were to take such a step, it would simply push Israel farther down into the bottomless pit of regional isolation and perpetual warfare. Uh, they would never be at peace with their neighbors, and uh, that kind of uh, attack would do them no good. And yet our media seems to love wars. They're very good for getting eyeballs to TV stations so that they can make ad dollars. Well, of course. Or am I being too cynical? Well, no, you're not being too cynical. The, the other big factor in terms of why we're hearing all the war rhetoric this year, of course, is our election calendar. Right. And that plays off against the Israel dimension that I was just discussing. Yeah, it was, it was four years ago that John McCain was singing bomb, 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 bomb Iran to an audience yeah, of people. That's right. On and, the campaign and trail. clearly the Republican presidential candidates, with the sole exception of Ron Paul, uh, see this as a wedge issue, uh, see this as a device for trying to exploit uh, sympathy with Israel in particular by uh, seeing who can sound most bellicose on Iran. Yeah, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. They are. Paul Piller, WashingtonMonthly.com, the uh, director of study, uh, visiting professor and director of studies at the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University. Sir, thank you so much for the great work you're doing and for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you, Tom. It's, it's much appreciated. We will be back. Tom Hartman here with you. Stick around.